تفضل فيليب دكتور ممكن نسال عن الكونترسبشن ميثودز ذات شي مايت يوز او ممكن نسال عن الريجولاريتي اوف ذس سبوتينج اوكي فيليب هاو اولد از ذس ليدي شي از 58 اوكي اند از شي مينستريتينج نو واي وود شي بي اون او سي بيز ممكن مثلا كانت حاطه ديفايس من زمان و الناس يتقيموا يعني ممكن. This is a very quite remote problem. Okay. In real life it might be applicable, but in the exam it's not. Okay. Do you have anything else to ask this lady about? مش عارف إذا حكتها زميلتي بس ممكن نسأل عن vaginal discharge associated with the spotting or pain uh, or postcoital uh, bleeding or oh, say here. Okay, fair enough. Postcoital bleeding is a very good question if she's sexually active. Does anyone else have any other inquiries they'd like to ask this lady? Sarah. Uh, doctor, if she, if she has a vaginal uh, dryness. <clears throat> so you're asking about perimenopausal symptoms, okay. Anything else? Hassan? Uh, yes, Doctor. Um, من هلا حسن ولا حسان هاي المرة؟ حسن حسن. Okay. تمام تفضل. Uh, دكتور ممكن نسألها إذا في مثلا urinary symptoms أو إذا في مثلا كمان blood during uh, urination مثلا أو uh, from other يعني sites per rectum أو شيء زي هيك. Okay, so other sites of bleeding. Okay. So every everyone who presents with any symptom of bleeding, we should ask about all other sites of bleeding. Does anyone else have any other questions? Hassan? Doctor, ممكن نسأل مش عارف إذا نسألها إن إذا في عندها مثلاً بين يعني related لل hair bones مثلاً يعني something like that. Okay, this is not really an important question. The only situation I think about such uh, the validity of such a question if that if we're concerned with metastasis to the bones, and even in cases of most gynecological malignancies, they rarely do metastasize to the bone. Okay. Okay. So it's not quite a good question. So in general, as per any other interview, we should start with history. And in the interview of this lady, as per any other history, we should start by analyzing the chief complaint. When exactly did it start? How did it progress? What's the amount of bleeding? Are there any clots? Or, and so on. We should ask about associated symptoms, mainly focusing about anemia. We should ask about pain and postcoital bleeding and all the perimenopausal symptoms, but they're not as important as anemia and pain. We should ask her about her medical history. What specifically about her medical history are we concerned with? Would anyone care to tell me? In such a lady. Philip? Mumkin bleeding disorders. Okay, so bleeding disorders usually would have meant if they're hereditary, they would have manifested by now. In general, bleeding disorders, when they're associated with uterine bleeding, they're associated with menorrhagia from the onset of menarche. That's the typical presentation, especially for US students. But what else? Hello. Um, she had diabetes, hypertension. Okay, that's very good. Does she have diabetes? Does she have hypertension? Is she on any special drugs such as HRTs, selective estrogen receptor modulators, any anticoagulants? This is a very common cause, anticoagulants. It's a lady with some cardiac disease or AFib and so on, they're on a potent antiplatelet or warfarin and so on. Then we should ask her about her family history, with Hela, which Hella already said in the beginning. We should ask her about any history suggestive of hereditary and polypotic colon cancer or 
PRCA type 2, because these have increased risk of endometrial cancer. We should analyze her gynecological history. Our main elements are, when was her last pap smear and what was the result? When did she hit menarche and menopause? If you didn't know what, when did she hit menopause? In this case, we do, so it's menarche only. Did she undergo any gynecological surgeries or treatments in general? Okay, any questions about these issues? So after our interview, this is what this is a summary of her answers. So this lady reports that she have had several episodes. Her vaginal spotting usually occurs in most days. It's generally light, but for the recent few days, it was as heavy as a period. There is no associated pain. She's never been married or been sexually active, and she has no gynecological history. She has never had a pap smear done. She's been diagnosed with, with type 2 diabetes, for which she takes oral hypoglycemic agents. However, she is not compliant with diet modification and her blood glucose sugar, her blood glucose is not well controlled. So insulin is being considered to be started with her. She's hit menarche at 13 and she's not on any other medications as of yet. OK. I'm sorry. So by mistake, you've already looked. So these are our main issues we should focus upon during our examination. Any lady of which we are concerned with endometrial cancer, we should ask her about, we should uh, take her height and weight to calculate the body mass index. We should take her blood pressure. We should do an abdominal palpation for masses. We should do a lower genital tract examination, a pelvic examination, mainly a speculum exam, and if applicable, a bimanual exam. Okay. Any other, any questions about this issue? Okay, would anyone care to tell me why are we doing a speculum exam in this case? What are we looking for? Sama? Um, the speculum here, we do first uh, the pap smear, and then we maybe look for uh, any masses in the cervix for any discoloration. Okay. And what else are we mainly we're looking for? Which is, a, which is far more likely than any abnormality with the cervix in the first place, any especially in a lady who's not sexually active. Okay, lacerations are also very unlikely. Any trauma to the lower genital tract is quite unlikely to happen. Hala, do you have a suggestion? Um, maybe we should look for atrophic vaginitis. Yes, so how would you know that this lady might be having atrophic vaginitis? What would suggest to you that this is atrophic vaginitis? Maybe if there's thin vagina, um, it's dry, if there's uh, ulcerations. Okay, so usually it's dry, it's pale, it's not shiny, it's very, very easily injured. The rugi might be less pronounced, and you'll only be able to judge this by experience. Of course, a drug vaginitis is a histopathological diagnosis, but it's also a diagnosis of exclusion. So mainly we reach it, we suspect it by examination, but we can label it as a cause only after ruling out all other causes. So what should we do next? After doing a proper, after asking a proper history and performing a proper examination in this patient, what shall we do? Hello. We should do transvaginal ultrasound. Do you raise your hand again, or you forgot it raised from before? No, hello, Rafat. Okay, Fadl. Uh, we should do transvaginal ultrasound. 
and intermediate okay. Oh, let's go step by step. Do not skip steps, especially in your exam, because you only lose marks. OK, so we'll do an ultrasound. Is there anything else we might do in someone with bleeding? Philip. Cervical uh, smear. OK, cervical smear is not done for every patient with postmenopausal bleeding unless you suspect a cervical pathology. Unless I give you proper hints, there is a cervical pathology. OK. It's usually not done uh, unless it's due. OK. So if a lady had her pap smear done five years ago, we'll do it right now. But in general, it's a screening test. It's not a diagnostic test. Is there anything else, someone with bleeding, that we might consider doing? Hello. Maybe CBC to exclude. Yeah, any CBC. Well, I already told you in history, we want to rule out anemia by history, and we have to rule it out by investigating her. Any patient with bleeding, whether postmenopausal bleeding or heavy menstrual bleeding, we should do a CBC. So this is her actual ultrasound. By the way, this is an actual lady. She presented around two, three days ago. So this is her ultrasound. What does her ultrasound show? Would anyone care to try to guess what's wrong with this ultrasound? Of course, something has been cropped over here. And I'll write it later on, but let's see if you can judge just by the image. Hello? Doctor, I'm not sure, I mean, but I think that there is uh, there is increased thickness in the uterus. Not the uterus. What's thickened? It's not the uterus per se. What's the proper term? I'll give you a chance. OK, yeah. So the endometrium is thickened in this case. That's what's happening here. So if you look, this is a transvaginal ultrasound, which is way more sensitive than transabdominal ultrasound, especially that this lady's obese. So even abdominal ultrasound would be even harder. This is the outline of the uterus. If you see here, this is where the patch of Douglas is. So if there is any blood or ascites, we'll see some hypoacousty somewhere around here. This is where the bladder should be. But of course, this is a transvaginal scan. So we ask a lady to empty her bladder before performing the scan. This is the cerv cervical canal. And the endometrium is usually a hyperequic line somewhere in the middle. And this is the endometrium. And a lady, who's not in her luteal phase or not menstruating, we should not see it as thickened. Usually it's barely visible. Of course, in actuality, in most cases, these calibers are the areas or the distance we're measuring. And you'll see something somewhere around here or here. In the exam, of course, seeing like E dot T, which is an acronym for endometrial distance, uh, uh, thickness, or a D, which means distance. So what we're measuring. And when do we considering thickened? When do we consider it thickened? The endometrium in a postmenopausal lady. This is one of the numbers that you have to memorize in regards to postmenopausal bleeding. Philip. Uh, more than four millimeters. Yes. So more than four millimeters is abnormal in a lady who ceases to menstruate. Especially that she's not on any hormone replacement therapy. So if it's more than four, it's thickened and it's abnormal. If it's less than four, it's normal. And what would the endometrial thickness be for a lady who's menstruating? Premenopausal, in other words. Would anyone know? This is a number that you, I don't care if you memorize. You just memorize the four millimeters for endometrial thickness in postmenopausal ladies. In general, in premenopausal ladies, 
the endometrial thickness depends on which stage of the menstrual cycle is she. Early on, it's usually somewhere between four and six in the proliferative phase. In the secretory phase, it can reach up to 1.5 centimeters. Okay, that's in premenstrual women. Premenopausal, sorry. So we don't rely on endometrial thickness in premenopausal women. We do in postmenopausal women. And why does it matter? What's the endometrial thickness? How would it impact our treatment? Samah? Um, no, doctor, but I couldn't have it before I was sick. Hello? If the endometrial thickness is uh, less than 4 millimeters, we can exclude having endo endometrium hyperplasia or malignancy. So this is uh, most likely uh, the bleeding is caused by atrophic endometrium. Um, it, if it's more than 4 millimeters, um, this may... Uh, give a hint about uh, endometrial cancer or hyperplasia. So we do uh, we do biopsy to confirm and uh, we we go on with the management if it's endometrial cancer. Okay, so you answered it for the most part. So in general, that would determine how should we go for, forward. If it's less than four millimeters, it's quite unlikely. It's not impossible to have any malignant or pre-malignant endometrial lesion. If it's more than four, it's more likely. So that will determine whether we will need to do an endometrial biopsy or we don't need to do an endometrial biopsy. Okay. So what should what, what should we do in the, her case, this lady? She's 58, she's obese, she's diabetic, she presents with six months of postmenopausal bleeding, and we notice an endometrial thickness, we should do an endometrial biopsy. And how do we, how should we perform this endometrial biopsy? What's the procedure called? Philip. Hysteroscopy. Okay, does anyone have any other answers? Hello? DNC, okay. DNC. Does anyone have any more complete answer than Philip and Hala? What do we call the procedure at which we obtain an endometrial biopsy to investigate the possible cause of the abnormal uterine bleeding, regardless of the type? It should, it should be answered as hysteroscopy guided endometrial biopsy or hysteroscopy guided DNC. So it's not DNC alone, it's not hysteroscopy alone, it's hysteroscopy guided DNC or hysteroscopy guided endometrial biopsy. That's the correct answer. Because DNC suggests that it's a blind procedure, you just curated this, the endometrial surfaces and the endometrial cavity. And hysteroscopy, you just look, you don't obtain a sample. So it's a combined procedure. So this lady, these are the hysteroscopic findings. I know you're not familiar with hysteroscopy, but if you try to guess, you'll see here that they're sort of like Kruki and polypoid lesions within the intermediate cavity. It's thickened, it's uh, irregular, it's not a smooth surface like it should be. And what would that tell us? What's the most likely problem here? She had to guess. Hala. Endometrial polyp. Okay, no, it's not an endometrial polyp. I said polypoid, I didn't say a polyp. So this is either usually with Ah Philip Tutta. Can hyperplasia it's good? It could be either hyperplasia or early stage malignancy. We can't tell for sure from the more just the morphology. But when we see such thickening, especially that at ladies, postmenopausal, it's quite abnormal. Uh, from what so far we've talked about this lady, what are her risk factors 
for this issue. Sama? Uh, the age. Okay, her age or actually in actuality her menopausal status, not her age per se. Anything else? Hassan? Uh, doctor, maybe her di uh, yani diabetic condition, uncontrolled diabetes. Diabetes is very important. It's more important than her age. Hassan? Uh, Nalipara. Okay, that's very good. Philip. Oh, Philip Nazalido. Hello. Do you have another suggestion? She's obese. She's obese. Very good. So these are the main issues, the main risk factors this lady have. What other risk factors might be the case for hyperplasia and uh, malignancy, endometrial malignancy? Does anyone know or have another risk factor that, that might not be present in this case, but might be the cause of hyperplasia and malignancy? Hello? Uh, late age menopause. Late onset of menopause. Okay, very good. Well, uh, no. uh, fibra of no, polycystic ovarian syndrome. وفي early minor و family history وممكن ال estrogen screening tumors such as the uh, ovarian breast the colon cancer that's in regards to family history but these are not estrogen uh, screening uh, tumors uh, ovarian um screening tumors would anyone care to tell me what's what's the tumor that secretes estrogen Okay, so that's granulosa cell tumors. Remember that granulosa cells are the cells that, the stromal cells of the ovary that secrete estrogen in normal circumstances. So if the mass of this granulosa cells is increased due to tumor or malignancy, then you'll have granulosa cell tumor. And one of the tumor markers of granulosa cell in actuality is estrogen, because it secretes a lot of estrogen. Because that's the normal function of granulosa cells, and they don't lose it if they grow a tumor. So in general, whenever we're considering the risk factors for endometrial malignancies and hyperplasia, they're usually divided into three main categories. The first is prolonged duration of estrogen exposure. So the lady has been exposed to normal amounts of estrogen, but for a longer time than she should be, or she might be in other cases. This might happen in early menarche, late menopause, and nulliparity, because she doesn't cease to mince due to pregnancy. The other category is what we call increased amount of estrogen exposure. So you have normal duration of estrogen exposure or normal length of reproductive life, but the total amount of estrogen this lady has been exposed, exposed to will be increased. This is the case in obesity because of prefer preferred conversion of androgens to estrogens in, a, in adipose tissue. That, that might be due to diabetes because insulin resistance will increase the free fraction of all steroids in the circulation. And remember that sex hormones are steroids. This might be due to polycystic ovarian syndrome because of the thicosis that happens in polycystic ovarian syndrome. It might be to exogenous exposure, such as tamoxifen, a selective estrogen receptor modulator, such as estrogen only hormone replacement therapy. And one comment about hormone replacement therapy. No doctor for the past three years will prescribe any lady with a uterus estrogen only hormone replacement therapy. Never ever. And if that happens, they should be investigated and their license should be withdrawn. Okay, so this risk factor is not in actuality risk factors because it shouldn't happen in the first place. 
So these all issues will and granulose cell tumors is the last one that will increase the total amount of estrogen. The other causes is mainly age, being postmenopausally in the first place, and familiar hereditary malignancies such as hereditary non polypotic colon cancer, which usually might present with colon cancer, prostate cancer, over rarely ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer in 60%, and PRCA type 2, or breast and rectal cancer type 2, which might present with mainly ovarian, but also in 15 to 20% endometrial, breast, and rectal cancer. So in general, these are the risks. But what could be other possibilities of this lady's complaint? So what, in other words, what should be our differential diagnosis whenever we have a lady with postmenopausal bleeding? Hello? Um, we said the most common cause of well, atrophic endometrium or atrophic vaginitis. Um, that it's not... It's not or, they're not the same pathology. Okay. So which uh, is more common, which is the most common? Uh, vaginitis or? No, endometrium. No, it's actually the atrophic vaginitis is the most common cause. It's not atrophic endometrium. Okay. Okay, and, but very good. Any other guesses? about our differential diagnosis for a lady with postmenopausal bleeding. So we have atrophic vaginitis. What could it be other than atrophic vaginitis? What's the second most common? Sama? Uh, fibroid. The here I think is unlikely because she's postmenopausal. Yes, so fibroids shouldn't, although they can be present, they would not be the cause of postmenopausal ble bleeding in this lady. Okay. Okay. Amr. Oh, Amr. Okay. So endometrial cancer are and hyperplasia we put it in the same category. But what's more common than endometrial cancer and and malignancy and hyperplasia? Sorry. Hello. Cervical or endometrial polyp. Okay, so mainly endometrial polyps. Yes, endometrial polyps are the cause in around 20 to 30 percent of postmenopausal ladies. Polyps are usually more common in postmenopausal ladies. Uh, what are endometrial polyps in the first place? What's a polyp in general? When we see a, when we say a polyp in medicine. We use the term frequently, but do we understand what do we mean by polyp? Samah? And Turkey is uh, a mass, right? In the lining mainly. So if you had to give me a scientific definition of a polyp, what would you tell me? Yes, sir. You, get, you gave part of the answer, but it was not properly termed properly uh, proper linguistically nor scientifically. So what would you try to tell me? So polyps in general or any oh, sorry Mr. Chill has raised Voila, uh, Overgrowth of cells. Overgrowth of cells, that's hyperplasia. That's what hyperplasia mm -hmm. means, correct? Hi overgrowth of cells. If you had a camera for Eidu and Azrub, how do you say it? Hassan? Yes, doctor. Mumkin to raise tissue of tissue, raised tissue. Mumkin abnormally raised. Do you agree that some polyps are cystic and they're not raised? Uh, yes, of course. 
OK, so in general, a polyp is any overgrowth of a mucosal tissue. Usually it's protruding. It can have a stalk. It can. It may not have a stalk. It might be sessile. It might be coliform. They have different shapes. But it's, in general, a polyp is a morphological description of a pathology of the mucous surfaces. Remember that mucous surfaces are present in the nose. So if you have an nasal polyp, what do they call it usually? Adenoids. You can have a rectal polyp, you can have a colonic polyp, you can have a pharyngeal polyp, you can have an endometrial polyp, you can have an endocervical polyp, not cervical polyp, because they usually they arise from mucous surfaces, mucosa in other words. So any lumen that has a mucosa, you could have a polyp. The more important part is that it's a morphological description. It's not a, micro, a microscopic description. So a polyp does not mean that this pathology is benign, nor does it mean that this is malignant. Okay, it doesn't describe the histological architecture of the cells or the cytological architecture even of the cells in this overgrowth. Okay, does anyone have anything to add or any questions about what we've reached so far? Before we proceed. So as a summary to remind ourselves what happened so far, we have a 58 year old lady who's been menopausal since the age of 54, who's obese and diabetic. She has history of six months of postmenopausal bleeding. Her BMI is 32, an ultrasound showed thickened endometrium, and hysteroscopy guided DNC was done. During the DNC, we noticed that generally there is thickened endometrium. Just as a as images for you to go over, this is the difference. This is how atrophic endometrium in a postmenopausal woman should look, look like. You see it's flat, it's pale, it's not quite pink. And this is our lady. It's even paler and it's thickened. And this is another image of an atrophic endometrium during hysteroscopy. Would anyone care to tell me what do we call this area? Any clues? Doctor, what is the picture? If you don't know, we'll talk about it. In the exam, we'll talk about it. But this is a hysteroscopy. Samah, do you have any guess? Doctor, I think this is the ostium, more or less. This is the opening of the fallopian tube, right? This is the same as this. This is the same as this. So this is, you're correct, this is the left ossea, or ostium, actually. This is the opening to the fallopian tube from the uterus. Usually, malignancies usually arise somewhere around the ostium. And what would this be? The X. Clean rear loan ink. What would this be? Samah? Or did you see your hand from before? This is the fundus. The fundus. So this is the fundus. So in general, this is the left ossea. This is the right ossea. This is the fundus. A is the anterior wall. P is the posterior wall. And this is somewhere around the ismic portion of the uterus and the uh, cervical opening. Of course, you don't have to memorize all these for your students. Just know that these are called the ossia. Okay. 
that you should know from your anatomy. So as I said before, this was an actual lady. After doing the ultrasound, we decided we need to do an endometrial biopsy, which we've done. And this is the actual result of her endometrial biopsy. I'll give you a couple of, and that's how you should expect a report from any histopathologist to be. Usually you'll have the patient's detail in the beginning. Of course, for privacy, I removed all of these. You'll have the site where we obtained this biopsy from. You should give the doctor, the pathologist, proper overview of the complaints and the clinical findings. There'll be a gross or morphological examination by the naked eye. What, what do we see? And a microscopic examination. And then usually there is a conclusion and advices or suggestions from the pathologist. So read over this report. I'll give you two more minutes. Philip, Fisal. Yes, Doctor. Could we ask uh, what type of biopsy do we take? Uh, is it true what cut or uh, punch? It's neither true cut or punch. It's curry touch. Okay, tamam. Do you risk bleeding or la? Okay, we'll discuss slightly the surgery after we're done with this report. Okay, just remind me if I forget. Tamam. So take two minutes to read over this report before I ask you a question. So I presume we've had enough time to go over this report. And would any care to tell me what's the diagnosis in this case? Hello? This is endometrial hyperplasia. Okay, so Hala suggesting endometrial hyperplasia. Does anyone else have any other suggestions? Before I give you the hint, before I show the hint later on. So it looks like we have no suggestions, so I'll show the hint. So would anyone care to tell me or give me the complete answer? Or would Hala like to add something else to her answer? Um, doctor, this is maybe um non-atypical simple hyperplasia okay fair enough and does anyone else have any other suggestions so this indeed is hyperplasia but it's not simple it is a tip with no atypia but it's complex okay in general there are two ways or two issues we describe in regards to endometrial hyperplasia. Endometrial hyperplasia, back in 1994, the World Health Organization suggested that we should classify it into architecture and nuclear atypia. In regards to architecture, by architecture we mean how do the glands look? Do they still resemble the normal endometrium? 
or they're crowded and they're long and they're tubular and they do, they're slightly more compressed than the normal endometrium. If they still do resemble the normal endometrium, that's simple. simple. So the architecture is simple. It should look like an endometrium. It does look like an endometrium. If it's crowded, if it's tubular, and if it's very low stromal to glandular ratio, that means this is complex architecture. The other issue is nuclear atypia. How does the nucleus look, the cytology? Does the nucleus still look like the normal endometrium? Or are there signs of nuclear atypia? Nuclear, atypical nuclei, suggestive of malignancies, have multiple descriptive factors I'll go over later on. So back then we had four classifications. Unfortunately, you guys don't read books. You just read lectures that are very, very old. And this classification ha has changed around eight, seven years ago. So not quite recently. In 1994, the classification was nuclear, uh, simple endometrial hyperplasia without atypia or simple with atypia and complex without atypia and complex with atypia. But we figured out that this classification doesn't matter. So our new classification is with atypia and without atypia. So we discarded architecture as a descriptive factor and we only focus about the presence and absence of atypia. Okay. So as a summary, this lady has complex endometrial hyperplasia with no ATP. So we've discussed how do we classify it, but why do we classify it this way? Philip. Doctor, just want to confirm if I understood the issue correctly or not. When we classify as simple and complex, we only uh, we only. Uh, <laughs> Look at the cell atypia, well, uh, well, okay, because the situation before was without atypia, but we put it complex. But, so, okay. Again, this is an older classification. This is not a valid classification anymore. We used to. I'll, I'll go over it slide in a slide or two. Okay. And if you don't understand it by then, uh, I'll ask. Okay. 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 That was the older classification. In the older uh, times, we had four classifications, four types, which is four classifications, according to two issues. First is architecture, by which we describe it as simple, simple and complex architecture. And the second is nuclear atypia, which we say it's present or absent. So two by two equals uh, four. Yes. Currently, we yes. discarded the architecture and we only focus about the presence and absence of atypia. So we only have two. But why do we care to classify it in the first place? Why does it matter? Hassan? Uh, doctor, I want to, uh, to answer wh why we classify it this way. Mumkin it, it affects um, the treatment uh, yani, uh, protocol or prognosis in the future for, for the patient. Yeah, actually it does. But why does it affect this treatment? Uh, because if it's, for example, atapia, mumkin it can uh, it suggests, yeah, any more more uh, uh, advanced treatment or something like that. Yeah, but why? We don't just change our treatment because we want to change our treatment. Um, I'd like you guys to try to understand the principles in general, not in obstetrics and gynecology in medicine. Why do you determine thresholds? Why do we classify in the first place? Yeah, to, to avoid methane going to uh, a malignant uh, stage. Yeah, to know, to know. OK, so I'll go over it in, a, in one more slide, OK? Let's disregard classification. So far, we have a 58-year-old postmenopausal woman with complex endometrial hyperplasia without atypia. How should we manage this lady? What's the next step? Would anyone care? Suggest a treatment option or treatment options for this lady? Hello? Hey, maybe we do hysterectomy. Hello, suggest hysterectomy. Hassan. Uh, doctor, يعني ممكن I consult her to to do some changes in her lifestyle or uh, 
to control her diabetes more in the first place. You can as Okay, so this is, this is very good. First, we try to remove all the reversible risk factors. The reversible risk factors in this lady is that she's obese, so we advise her to lose weight, and she's diabetic, so she ad we advise her to control her diabetes. That's very good. What else? Do we stop? Um, Philip? Mungkin is yad ali hakato hala and kun total abdominal hysterectomy with the BSO عشان give any risk لشيء بعدين يعني. Actually, the ideal treatment is total laparoscopic. If we need to do hysterectomy, it's total laparoscopic or vaginal hysterectomy with bilateral self-injectomy. It's not abdominal. There is no need to go through the abdomen. But that's beyond your scope as students. I wouldn't go through it. So in general, let's change the scenario slightly. Let's make her a 38-year-old lady with menorrhagia, and we found that she has complex endometrial hyperplasia without a TPA. What's the ideal treatment in that scenario? Hello? Um, I think maybe we give her progesterone and uh, follow her condition every three months. <laughs> So what type of progesterone would it be? In this case, we sh you should know. Progesterone can be given systematically, it can be given orally, it can be given transdermal patches, can be given in vaginal rings. There are numerous formulations of progesterone, but there is one that you should know by name. Uh, as students, at least this one. Philip. I'm not sure, but maybe the Mirena, which is the IUCD. Okay, what's the progesterone with Mirena? Levo, um, I said it's the camera. Okay, so it's levonorgestrel. So the ideal treatment would be a levonorgestrel and try a trying contraceptive device. So Mirena is a type of IUCD. It has a plastic and a vial. This vial has 52 milligrams of levonorgestrel that it releases around 24 nanograms of it per day. So that's the ideal and the first line treatment. But in this lady, she might be better off with a hysterectomy. But in as a general concept, treatment of hyperplasia without atypia is myrena. That's the first choice. What should we do after we insert the myrena? Do we send her home and tell her you're all good? Or do we have to do something else later on? Okay. Likely I'll go over the detailed management of the different types of hyperplasia. But in general, general about the classification of uh, endometrial hyperplasia. Remember that recently we've been trying to go or to change the terminology and we're trying to say that endometrial hyperplasia is not an appropriate term. We, we in some recent books, you might notice the term EIN or endometrial encytoneoplasia. Okay. Sort of like CIN and VIN, vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia, and endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia, and cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. The most recent classification was in 2014, which again says it's either non-atypical or without atypia, and atypical, i.e. with atypia. The older one was simple hyperplasia without atypia, complex without atypia, simple with atypia, and complex with atypia. This one we're trying to distance ourselves from it because it's quite old and it's not applicable anymore. It's not reproducible anymore. The pathologist will have difficulty to try to differentiate between those. So we simplified it because it's easier to work with and it's more applicable in treatment and management. So this one, not anymore. In general, what are the differences between the different types of ATP? 
The first is what we call the gland to stroma ratio, i.e. how much of the sample contains stromal tissue and how much control, uh, control uh, sorry, contains proper endometrium and mucosa. So if it's more than 50-50%, yeah, 50% glands and 50% stroma, this is hyperplasia by definition. If there is almost no stroma, this is usually with a TB. In regards to cytology, or in other words, how do the nuclei and the cells themselves look? If they're similar to the rest of the cells of the endometrium, this is usually non-atypical. If they're different, and different we mean either the nucleus is quite large, if there are spiky nuclei, you might see that the site of the nucleus, instead of being at the base like uh, normal columnar cells, they might be deviate to the apex, for instance. The nu nuclear cytoplasmic ratio could be increased. Sometimes there are what we call cytoplasmic clearing. These are all descriptors of nuclear atypia. So that will be atypia. The most important issue for the ASC students is that non-atypical nuclear hyperplasia usually have a low risk of progression to malignancy, around 1 to 3 percent, as opposed that's over 1 over 3 years and 3 percent over 20 years, by the way. And with atypia, has a quite a high risk. One in four ladies will develop frank malignancy in, in three years, and in 10 years, 70 percent of them will have atypia. And even worse, that sometimes even if we obtain samples and it tells us that there is only atypia, the hyperplasia without atypia, if we remove the uterus and we look at all the surfaces, in one in three we'll find endometrial carcinoma in cyto. So that's the main differentiating factor for you as students, is that there's higher risk of malignancy and that's why treatment is different. That's why we treat them differently. The risk issues are beyond generally beyond your scope. They're just for the curious among you. In general, the changes in non-atypical hyperplasia is diffuse among all the surfaces of the uterus, but in those with atypias, usually focal. And that's why we try to obtain a global DNC from all the surfaces. Because if you obtain samples from, let's say, three surfaces, they all might be normal but the fourth will have some focal changes, which are the ones that are important for our case. There are tumor suppressor genes, such as P10, which is also associated with Coden syndrome, and PAX2. In non-atypical hyperplasia, they're usually present, so the cells will be able to suppress any tumorous progression, but without a TPA, these are usually absent, i.e. the function has been lost, so any abnormality will be easily progressed into malignancy. And lastly, the treatment. Non-atypical, usually is treated hormonally using, as we said before, Mirena, a levonorgestrel releasing intrauterine device. With AT is usually surgical in the form of simple hysterectomy. The route is slightly beyond your scope, but in general, the least invasive, the best. Okay. In regards to the hormonal treatments, these are all the progesterones that you can use for treating endometrial hyperplasia. Again, the only one that I'd like you to remember is the last one. Sorry. This one. This is the name of my arena. These are the different formulations of progesterone that are widely available. There is one that's not here, which is called norethisterone acetate, which is the one that most ladies are familiar with. Does anyone recognize these uh, packets of medication? This is nor these are the formulations of norethisterone acetate that are available in Jordan. If you look through the medication cabinet of most ladies in Jordan, I'm sure at least 40% of them, you'll find this in their medication cabinet. 
they usually use it in use Aminoria. For instance, if a lady wants to fast and wants to skip her cycles during Ramadan, or she's going to get married soon and she doesn't want to have menses during her first day, first days of marriage to copulate properly, or they're going for Hajj and they want to skip her cycles, or she just wants to regulate your cycles. This is one of the cheap and widely available drugs, norethisterone acetate. And these are the two, two formulations available in Jordan. Would anyone care to tell me what's the difference between these two devices? Anyone? Okay, Samah. Let's say this is um, the oh, this is a Ashan is ahead of the uh, uh, the material used for used from and it be this is uh, copper. Okay, and what's A? Um, plastic. What do we call A and B? Let's put it in this way. What do we call A and what do we call B? Philip? هسه انا انا من التايتل شفت اي يو سي دي او اي يو دي ف ذيز ار انترتشينجبل تيرمز انا فكرت انه وان اوف ذيم الدوز تاعها انف تو بي يوزد از كونتراسبتيف وذا اذر از نوت بس اتوقع ان شاء الله الجواب لا اوكي سو ود اني ون كير تيل مي واتس اي اند واتس بي اول شيء واضحه الصوره ولا لا؟ اغير الباك جراوند So B is a traditional intrauterine contraceptive device, otherwise called copper T. It has copper and it's shaped like a T. It has multiple shapes. The codes are usually either on the stock or in the arms, somewhere around here. Okay, this is actually called Baragard, the trade name for this particular device. This one. You see it's plastic and it has sort of like a vial or a gel around here. That's the Myrena and that's where the medication is. Okay, so this is Myrena A. This is the one we use for hyperplasia, menorrhagia. We use it for contraception and so far it has not yet been approved for emergency contraception. And you usually change it after five years. Okay. This is the copper form. This is cheaper. We can use it for emergency contraception, but it can be associated with menorrhagia abnormally trying bleeding. And we keep it for 10 years. Just for you to differentiate. Sometimes you'll have the images similar to these in your mini OSCE exam. Okay. So in general, how do we manage hyperplasia? First, for both, we try to remove reversible risk factors, such as if she's taking unopposed hormone replacement therapy, obesity, if she's diabetic, we control her diabetes, and so on. Then, if it's without etipia, the first line, as we said before, LNG is the abbreviation for levonorgestro, so as doctors we don't like to we don't like to write long words so lng instead of uh levonorgestrel and tx is methotrexate asa is aspirin and so on so we put in a levonorgestrel releasing device and we repeat this biopsy in six months and every six months if we obtain two samples that are normal, that show regression of the disease, then we can remove or stop our treatment and discharge the patient. Okay, if we fail to improve in 12 months of treatment, then we have to go for simple hysterectomy, either with or without side pinch of rectomy, depending on the age. In a patient with atypia, the ideal treatment 
is immediately simple hysterectomy with and without bilateral cell pincher or phorectomy. Okay, that's the ideal treatment. But in this particular lady, in real life, she refused to undergo hysterectomy. So do we have any other option in a lady with atypia and refusing to go hysterectomy? What can we go for? We can go for the same treatment as with without atypia, but the difference is we repeat the samples every three months. And this is sometimes this is more applicable in cases, for instance, in a lady of her reproductive age group who has hyperplasia with atypia and she would still like to conceive later on in life. We preserve the endometrium, we preserve the uterus, we give her hormonal treatment, we keep sampling every three months and then every whenever they're normal we, we sample every six months and whenever she completes her family we do the hysterectomy done okay any questions so far doctor سؤال <laughs> I'm going to ask you 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 to she needs to have the, this device for five years. Well, intrauterine, uh, well, Marina. She she doesn't have to have it for five years. It's usable for five years. So can she get pregnant in this duration? Usually not. If she has an IUCD still in situ, she will not be able to conceive. Meaning she has endometrial hyperplasia and in pregnancy, the estrogen levels and progesterone will increase. So uh, this no. could... Like, sure, sure. Okay, خليني بس أوقف لا إحنا خربطنا بكم مشاله. هلا again the first line treatment for hyperplasia without atypia is leave or just a releasing and trying device. We put it in, then we obtain an endometrial sample after six months to monitor if she's improving or not. If she's improving, that's very good. We repeat the sample again six months afterwards. And we never, whenever the samples we're obtaining show us that she doesn't anymore have endometrial hyperplasia, we can discharge this patient and tell her she, that she can't conceive. If she really does want to conceive, we'll just remove the IUCD and then she'll be able to conceive. She would have reverted to normal. We see a regression. Hyperplasia has one of three natural, uh, natural uh, histories. Either it will regress, yani it will return to normal endometrium, it will stay as a tibia, or it will progress. Progress, for instance, from without a tibia to with a tibia, and later on to carcinoma in situ, and later on to frank malignancy. The whole principle is that we're trying to stop the endometrium from progressing, and we're trying to regress the, the hyperplasia. Okay? That's the whole principle of treatment. And that's why we repeat the samples, because we're trying to figure out that we stop the progression, that we revert to normal or regress, which, which is our goal in the first place. Now, if a lady with a history of ATP conceives, remember this lady, yes, there will be estrogen in pregnancy, but there will be also progesterone. And this is what we were giving her. And this will actually lower her risk. That's why nulliparity is a risk factor, but multiparity is not a risk factor. Did I answer your question? Ah, doctor, and that's why sometimes even when ladies with atypia, we can use progesterone if they still want to conceive later on in life. We use progesterone whenever she reverts or regresses, she can't conceive and whenever she completes her family, then we'll do the hysterectomy. 
Does anyone else have any other questions? Okay, so uh, Philip, if I remembered, asked about the complications of hysteroscopy in DNC, correct? Uh, yes, biopsy, yes. Okay, so in general, the main complication we're concerned with is perforation of the uterus. Because the initial part of the procedure is usually blind, especially during dilatation of the cervix and sounding of the uterus. So we can't perforate the uterus. This perforation can be exclusive to the uterus, i.e. we perforate the uterus and that's it. Or remember that we have organs surrounding the uterus. We can either injure the bladder or the bowel or the arteries around the uterus. So how do we treat it? It depends about what we injured other than the uterus. That's our main complication. We could have infections, endometritis. We could have some bleeding. Usually ladies will have some cramping, sort of like uh, dysmenorrhea and the characters of the cramping pain for the first day or two. If curettage was done after uh, miscarriages, for instance, which should not be done. This is not the treatment for miscarriages. If we, if someone does curettage after a miscarriage, there will be increased risk of Asherman syndrome because they'll usually ex remove excessive layers of decidua and expose the myometrium, and this will form adhesions later on in life. Okay. Did I answer your question, Philip? Maybe sometime later, I'll show you the videos yes. of astroscopy yes. and yes. DNC. Okay. Does anyone else have any other questions? Have fun. Does anyone else have any questions about our presentation today? Okay, so this is also another image to show you how the endometrium should look like in a postmenopausal lady. It should look like a thin hyperechoic stripe. And that's usually the presentation when it's a normal endometrium. Of course, you see whenever we measure a distance, usually it'll be somewhere at the lower middle or right corners of the ultrasonographic image. So here you'll see that D or DIST means distance, it's around two millimeters, which is normal. You see a thin stripe, as opposed to the image that we say we saw before, which shows a significantly thickened endometrium. So compare these two. So I presume we're done with our today's presentation. I'll stay on for the next few minutes if anyone else have any questions about today's discussion or anything in regards to gynecology in general. The rest are free to leave. Laughing. Doctor, um, yes, as well, but so we're not related to this lecture. Okay, go ahead. Um, I want to ask about uh, cervical ectropion, how it can okay. be presented or complications of it. Cervical ectropion usually presents either with clear vaginal discharge or, most commonly for US students, post coital bleeding can also present with intermenstrual bleeding. Okay, so the presentation is usually either intermenstrual or more commonly postcoital bleeding, traumatic, because the cervix has changed from squamous cells, the ectocervix, from squamous cells to columnar cells, and columnar cells are usually more fragile 
and they're single layer, they can't stand friction. So they usually present with postcoital bleeding or intermenstrual bleeding, and less commonly with a clear vaginal discharge. What we do? Speculum, pap smear. If we need to treat, it's usually by ablation. Ablation is either using cryotherapy, we use liquid nitrogen to try to freeze the area, or cautery. We use heat to destroy the area, or laser is commonly if available to vaporize the area with columnar metaplasia. Did I answer your question about ectropion, or do you have other questions? Uh, the, this is very not shock conductor. Oh, fine. Does anyone else have any questions? So, Matt, do you have another question or are your hands still raised from before? The Adam Gebel. Okay. Okay, so if we don't have any.